I'll just, just uh, say a few things for a couple of minutes whilst people are coming into the room. So good morning to those of you on a European type time zone. Good evening to those of you somewhere in Australia or anywhere out in the East. And I can actually see on the attendees this morning, we've even got some people that I believe are in America. So good night to you as well. I guess many people will be watching this recording. So we're hoping that we're gonna get yesterday's talks onto YouTube today so that anyone that has any questions will be able to kind of contribute to the Slack discussion if they weren't able to catch the talks live. Um, yeah, I believe yesterday's session, so I've been told that you can't see how many attendees are in it. So yesterday we had 95 attendees and people are still coming into the room now. Wow. Yeah, so our first speaker today is Ben Brown from the University of Sydney. He's going to be talking about universal fault tolerant measurement based quantum computation. He hasn't got Slack set up yet, but he's going to set it up after his talk. Um, so you can still post questions there and he'll, he'll get around to answering them once he's installed his Slack. Okay, take it away, Ben. Is that, I, 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 you have to stop share. Oh, no, I, I can. I can override you. It's, it's, uh, all right, here we go. You can see my slides? Uh, yeah, that's all I can. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Thanks for the organizers. Thanks to the organizers for organizing this conference. I can imagine it's very difficult uh, under all the circumstances. Um, so this, this is kind of old work, um, but I've never really had much chance to talk about it because uh, just lots of papers all came out at the same time. And I didn't get a chance to talk about this one, but I, I think it's still good. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I did it with Sam Roberts. He should have done, he should have given this talk really, but um, he booked his holiday at the same time. And, and yeah, I haven't even talked about it in Europe. So this is a European exclusive, except I, I guess it's going out to the world. So that, well, that's what it is. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about measurement based quantum computation, fault tolerant measurement based quantum computation. Um, and yeah, some, some progress we've made in that. All right, um, so uh, let me just, I have a couple of slides summarizing what we did. Um, so measurement-based quantum computation, um, this is uh, a way of modeling fault tolerant quantum computation. And it's quite a nice model uh, from a practical perspective if you are, uh, if you, sorry, I'm just gonna try and hide my face. Oh, that's better, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so measurement-based quantum computation, it's um, particularly well-suited to um, uh, uh, photonic implementations, uh, mostly because if you're going to make your qubits with photons, your qubits are going to fly off really fast. So measurement-based quantum computation uh, kind of fixes that problem in a way, because all, all you have to do is you make this big entangled state, and um, then you measure it. And kind of the computation is already encoded in the entangled state you made. So yeah, you just make these single qubit measurements on the, the, the state and then the computation is done. And if you make the right kind of cluster state, you can also detect the errors. So that was shown to us by Rausendorf in a whole series of papers. This is one of them uh, around 2006, 2007. The first one was in 2005 with uh, Harrington and Bravi. Um, right, and he actually showed us how to do a lot of fault tolerant quantum computation with the surface code in this paper. It's, it's kind of weird because I find this model is a lot more complicated to a lot of people compared to just the two dimensional surface code. Um, but there we go, that's the way around it went. So we, we learned how to braid punctures and do a lot of Clifford gates um, with that model. But then, well, in, in the meantime, um, like quantum computation has come on a lot with surface codes and stabilizer codes, and they, uh, which are a bit different from this, this uh, cluster state model. And it fell a bit behind. So um, what, we, what Sam and I did is we found ways of getting all of the advances in stabilizer fault tolerant quantum computation, in particular code deformations, and we put them back into the, the topological cluster state model. Um, in particular, we... Uh, yeah, so the, this is some work from a paper of mine, um, this one here at the bottom. And uh, we, we showed how to braid Majorana modes in the surface code. And what, what we really wanted to figure out was how to do that in the, the topological cluster state model. So it, it was actually, we did a bit more work than that. To do that problem, we had to build this whole theory of 
foliation and measuring base quantum computation in cluster states in general. So as well as having these gates in the, the this Rausendorf model, this topological cluster state model, in fact, what we can do is we can take any uh, method of doing measurement based gates or code deformations with any stabilizer code and we can encode it into some measurement based scheme in a constructive way. And we can also put all those, uh, we can put all those pieces together to do a full fault tolerant quantum computation. Uh, so that's roughly, that's what this picture at the bottom is showing in these kind of like toy blocks. Um, they're all different types of cluster states that are all connected to each other in some way. And uh, throughout that, that there's a time direction. And if you measure all of those qubits, you, you do a computation. Um, so that, those are the things I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you, I, well, I'm going to go the other way around, actually. I'm going to show you um, first our whole theory of measurement based quantum computation. And then I'll, I'll show you how we use that to, uh, to make the, the surface code gates uh, we want to make. And finally, I have a little bit to say about the kind of the bigger picture of why so I, I, I did motivate this at the beginning by saying, um, oh, well, you want to do cluster states and measurement based quantum computation if you've got photons. Um, you don't think, don't, you don't want to pay attention because, um, because you don't care about photonic implementations because you've got trapped ions or you've got superconducting qubits. Um, I'm going to talk about that at the end, why everybody should care about uh, measurement based quantum computation. Um, but yeah, that's not until the end, so I'll get to that. Um, right, so first of all, let me just say a little bit about um, measurement-based quantum computation and photonic implementations. So this is, I'm gonna be showing a lot of graphs, graph states. Um, so cluster states are a kind of entangled state. Um, you, they, they're well represented by a graph. Um, so a graph has some vertices and some edges. Uh, the way a, a graph state or a cluster state works is you put a qubit on every vertex of a graph uh, and you prepare that in the plus state. And then if there is an edge on that graph, then you entangle those two qubits on those two vertices uh, with a, a controlled phase gate. And that's a cluster state. So for example, here, here's a 1D cluster state. We have a bunch of qubits in a line and we entang entangle nearest neighbors with controlled phase gates. Um, this is useful for uh, propagating a single qubit. So a cluster state, one way you can think about these uh, models is you can kind of think of them as, uh, they, they kind of simulate a time direction, which is, is, is a really nice picture to have because space and time normally seem kind of different in fault tolerant quantum computation. But uh, in the, the measurement based picture, the time is replaced by more qubits. So space and time kind of get, uh, you know, treated on an equal footing. So what happens in a 1D cluster state is logical information is encoded on one end of, end of the wire, and then you measure qubits and that will push the information down that wire. So I'm also gonna say a lot about this particular uh, uh, cluster state, um, this three-dimensional topological cluster state. So this is how it was originally introduced as, um, uh, you, you take some 3D manifold and you break it up into some cells so cubes will do. And you put a qubit on every single face and every single edge of that, uh, of, of that lattice. And then you entangle, uh, you entangle qubits that are on the same, that, that share. If a qubit is on a face uh, and it neighbors an edge, then you entangle those ones as well. And if you build a big lattice of those, you get this, you can do fault tolerant quantum computation. And I'm going to say a lot more about that as we go, because uh, this is very well connected with the surface code that I'm kind of expecting everybody to know uh, a few things about already. Um, you don't need to know too much about that, though. Uh, just a little bit. So how would you make one of these things? Now, this is not my expertise. So I think at the last Benas conference, this was actually uh, Mercedes's talk. She's, uh, she's a researcher at SciQuantum. Um, but if you want some idea on how you would build one of these uh, cluster states. Uh, I, I'm really going to start at the level of qubits, um, but there are, uh, yeah, there are people have thought quite hard about how to build these with photons. Um, what you have to do is you prepare bell pairs of photons, and then you can make increasingly bigger uh, lattices or entangled states with uh, what are known as uh, fusion measurements. So these were originally introduced by 
Dan Brown and Terry Rudolph, where you take two qubits. So for example, over here, you take two qubits of an entangled bell pair and you put them through some parity measurement. So you burn a qubit, but you make a, a bigger piece of uh, a, a, a big entangled lattice, a bigger entangled lattice. And so more recently, uh, this was Mercedes's PhD work. She was doing this. We we're both doing our PhDs around the same time. And she did this during her PhD. She was um, in this paper, this poem one I've referenced, they look at how you can take little three uh, qubit GHZ states and you put them through a bunch of beam splitters to build a whole Rausendorf model. Um, so again, I'm not the expert on that. Uh, I, I would point you to Mercedes if you want to know more about how to implement these things. Uh, but I'm just saying like, this is how we might imagine building such a thing. All right, so let me talk a bit more about cluster states and how, how we're going to use them to default to our quantum computation. So here I've shown a picture of the surface code, but it could be any quantum error correcting code. Um, I, I don't want to go into the details too much, but what do you need to do? Well, what do you need to make a, a quantum error correcting code? Well, two things, and I've written on the slide already. You, you, you need qubits, and you need to measure parity measurements. The parity measurements are stabilizer measurements, and we use those to check for errors. And yeah, and then there is some logical information encoded on all of those qubits, those, uh, those code qubits or data qubits, you might call them. And those data qubits are encoding some logical information. And to protect that logical information, we measure stabilizers. They detect which of the qubits have experienced errors. So what we need, what, yeah, we use this and we, we, we map this onto a measurement based picture. Like this is, we need these two things. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, putting logical qubits into cluster state models. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about doing parity measurements between them. All right, so here's the 1D cluster state. Let me talk about this in a little bit more detail. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, we prepare one of these 1D cluster states as a, uh, yeah, you, you prepare all of your qubits in plus, and then you prepare, uh, you, you entangle them with a, a controlled phase gate. Um, what, what we actually imagine doing is, is just a little bit more complicated that, than that. We, we, we don't prepare all the qubits in plus, we prepare all of them except for the first qubit in plus. That first qubit can be put in any arbitrary state, and then what we actually have is a stabilizer code. Um, so when we, after we perform the entanglement, uh, we have a stabilizer code with stabilizers that look like Pauli Z, Pauli X, Pauli Z uh, on three nearby qubits. And we have one of those for every site of, along the lattice. And this stable, I mean, it's not a good stabilizer code, it has distance one, but you can see that these are the logical operators after the entangling operation, uh, sigma X, sigma Z, is the Pauli X logical, and that anti-commutes with a single qubit Pauli Z on qubit one. Uh, so those are our logical operators. And so, uh, yeah, okay. And as I said, uh, what we do is we make measurements to push the information along this chain. So if we make a single qubit Pauli X measurement on qubit one, uh, this is going to push the information along by one unit. So that's what I'm showing down here. It, so in practice, what we're actually going to do is we're going to measure all of these qubits in parallel, probably, but it's kind of helpful to understand this picture just by um, uh, imagine doing the measurements sequentially. So if I were to make uh, a single qubit X measurement, I don't learn any logical information. Um, what I do is I'll infer the value of the X component of this logical X operator. And I definitely don't learn the, the logical Z information because that's the Pali Z operator on qubit one. And I'm measuring the X information so that th those don't agree. So when I make this measurement, we, we kind of deform the stabilizers. Um, the, the logical X operator, after you measure this single qubit X measurement and infer its value, turns into a single qubit Z measurement. And Likewise, uh, if I were to, well, okay, so first of all, what I have to do is I take the logical Z operator, which is shown here and here, and I multiply it by a stabilizer, I find when I measure the single qubit Z, uh, sorry, the single qubit X measurement on the first qubit, which I've colored in yellow, the logical Z operator 
jumps across to a Pauli X and a Pauli Z on qubits two and qubits three. So you can see I've pushed the information along. I've also kind of swapped over the, the shape or the, the, yeah, I've swapped these logical operators over. So before the measurement, the, um, the logical Z was a single qubit Z measurement. And now it's an X times the Z on the, the next two qubits. And conversely, uh, the logical X operator that was X Z is now just a single qubit Z. And I can read out um, what the logical information is by choosing to measure a, a Z on maybe qubit one if I wanted to learn the logical Z information. But if I measured the first qubit in X, I can actually learn the logical X information by measuring the second qubit in Z. Um, right, so what, what this means is if I want to measure some information from the single qubit, um, for, from the, the cluster state, the, the one qubit it's encoding, I just have to pick a qubit um, and I measure it in Z instead of X. So and I can do that anywhere along. So th this is actually why I've colored, the, um, I've colored the qubits, either black or red. If I measure a black qubit in Z uh, and all of the preceding qubits in X, then I learn the logical Z information. And if I measure a red qubit in Z and all the preceding qubits in X, then I learned the logical X information. And, and you can see that because uh, these are representatives of the logical, that's the logical X operator, and this is the logical Z operator. Uh, you find that by multiplying the logical operators by stabilizers. So again, this isn't fault tolerant. This is, if you get one error here, you're done. Um, but that doesn't matter just now. Uh, the point is we have information being pushed through this uh, this line, this 1D cluster state at, uh, with single qubit Pali X measurements, and you learn the logical information with a, a Pali Z measurement uh, if we want to do that. Okay, um, but here's the thing maybe we don't want to have to switch, um, maybe we don't want to switch basis. In fact, what we do want to do is we want to measure all of the qubits in that chain in Pali X, but we may still want to learn some logical information from one of those chains. So we do that non-destructively. So let me just talk about uh, very briefly uh, how we would do a non-demolition measurement of a qubit uh, in the circuit picture. So that's, that's here I'm showing a circuit which is doing just that. I have some logical information there on the, the top qubit, uh, the qubits encoded in psi. And if I want to measure it in the computational basis, I just prepare an ancilla qubit and tangle my ancilla to the, the, the logical qubit and then I measure it. And this tells me the, the, comp, uh, the, the this is, makes a computational basis measurement for this qubit psi, but the, the qubit psi flies off, it keeps going. And, and, and this is important if you wanna, like you, you don't wanna collapse your photonic qubit or something like this maybe. Um, and well, so this is exactly how we can make measurements in the, uh, in the from the one cluster state uh, without switching the measurement basis. So here I have exactly the 1D cluster state again, and I want to make a logical X measurement for the information traveling through. Well, all I do is I take a blue ancilla qubit and I couple it to a red qubit at, at some uh, time interval. Um, right, so I am calling these time intervals. Um, a, a time interval is a pair of qubits that includes a black qubit and a red qubit. And uh, I call them that because there's a time direction. And I want my time interval to include a red and a black qubit because I, I want to be able to measure either a logical X or a logical Z in, in any given time interval. Um, that's right. So uh, by taking this, but by building this graph state here where there is an extra qubit and uh, entangled to a red qubit, uh, and we measure all the qubits in X, then the logical information that was originally encoded uh, on the first qubit before we prepared the cluster state, uh, we're, we're gonna measure the logical X information from, from that qubit that's encoded as it travels by on this wire. Okay, um, so yeah, we can actually generalize this more. So now we're getting a little bit closer to, um, to how we might build a full stabilizer code. Uh, what do we have here? So this is showing two, log uh, two qubits on two cluster states, and we're entangling, um, I'm measuring uh, log x times x. So this is a little error detecting code that measures uh, x, x information from the two qubits on these two chains. 
Um, right. Uh, and, and this is really how we're going to build, uh, th this is the whole principle behind our, um, model of, um, foliation and, uh, building fault tolerant models of, uh, measure based quantum computation. The fact that we can do parity measurements this way, where we, um, encode qubits through the, uh, through the 1D cluster state wires. And right, so this, so Sam and the, so the difficulty is, uh, in, in the model I showed you before, uh, it was easy to measure uh, Pali X or Pali Z measurements, but Pali Y measurements weren't possible. And maybe we want to measure some, say, uh, non-CSS stabilizer codes, uh, because we want to measure a twist, which is going to be important later on. Well, then we need to, um, yeah, we need to find other ways to do that. And well, Sam and I, we found different ways. Uh, there's a bunch of different ideas on, on doing this. Um, in our paper. Uh, one of them is actually to measure the, the 1D cluster in the Y basis instead of the X basis. And this changes the time interval and it gives you access to Z, Y, or X information in a time interval. That's why we now have some green qubits. Uh, another way we can do it is we can take this Pali X ancilla qubit and entangle it to two qubits in, in a chain. Uh, so what, what we're showing here is actually a Pali Y, Pali Y parity measurement. And this is our whole model of fault tolerant quantum computation, actually. Like the, the paper is quite complicated, uh, but, it's, but just more sort of fiddly. It's like the, the difficulty in this whole problem is bookkeeping. So how are we gonna build a model of fault tolerant quantum computation with some stabilizer code uh, in this measurement based picture? Well, just like this, right? <laughs> uh, we're gonna assume we have a code that's gonna be some input and that's on these green qubits here. Then we initialize a bunch of other qubits. These black and red qubits are initialized in plus. So effectively what I'm going to do now is I'm going to entangle all of these qubits through lines. So I'm kind of, con it, it, you can think of this as concatenating the qubits of the code, this code over here into 1D cluster states. Then we decide on some stabilizers we might want to measure. And they, so these stabilizers might not even be the stabilizers of the input code. If we maybe want to do a code deformation where we measure different stabilizers to do some logical uh, transformation on, on the encoded information, well, then we might entangle these ancilla qubits in a different way to the 1D cluster states that are passing by. So this builds a resource state. And then finally, um, we measure all the qubits except for the, the qubits at the end. And these measurement uh, outcomes, uh, they tell us stabilizer information and they push all the information from the code on the input onto the code on the output while also doing some kind of code deformation. Um, I, I haven't said too much about what a code deformation is. I'll get to that uh, in just a moment. Um, okay, so, right, and, and this is what I'm saying. Um, what, what I just described there is one, uh, one channel which can map a code onto another code through a code deformation, and that will transform some logical information. Uh, it has an input and an output, and we can compose these channels. So if we take the, if we have, say, channel two and channel one, then if we make the output of channel one, the input of channel two, then yeah, we, we can build up these channels sequentially. And so here we've got three channels all composed together and we can build computations up this way. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, so let me just say a little bit about the maths of this. Um, so roughly speaking, um, you can think of measurement based quantum computation as a subsystem code actually, where we do a gauge fixing on the subsystem code. So uh, what do we have here? So uh, this is F, the foliated system. This is a subsystem code and it's the union of two stabilizer codes. One stabilizer is that of the cluster state and the other is that of the measurement pattern. Those are the single qubit X measurements or single qubit Y measurements we might make to push the information through the system. So we initialize the system in, uh, yeah, in, in, in a fixed gauge, the gauge R. So we're in a stabilized state of R. And then when we, when we measure M, we fix the gauge onto the gauge of M. And from M, we get to infer all kinds of stuff. It, it, it transforms the code by some kind of gauge fixing. And uh, yeah, that, this is the mathematics behind the model. And everything, like all the, fit, all the useful stuff, like where are the stabilizers and where are the logical operators, well, just like any subsystem code, they all live in the centralizer of F. So the, this whole model of foliation is kind of, is quite a nice way to see measurement-based quantum computation and code deformation and gauge fixing in general. 
Um, right, so we have two theorems in our paper, and I'm not going to bring them up here because they're, yeah, they're, they're fiddly, but they really, like, we, we have one of them, one theorem that tells us how the, the input and the output code map, depending on what cluster state you choose, and the cluster state depends on uh, what, what stabilizers you decide to measure. So there are three codes there, an input code, an output code, and what we call a channel code. And the input and the output code determine the, the sorry, the input and channel code determine the output. And then we also have another theorem which tells us what the stabilizers look like. So the microscopics of that channel uh, as, as the information is propagated. So that will tell us how we do error correction. And that theorem is useful if maybe you want to do a simulation or uh, you know, test, find a threshold or, or, or a logical, an overhead scaling or something like that. Right, so first of all, let me just see, show you what happens when we do this. Well, we can foliate the surface code and we get the Rausendorf model back. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's not, um, that's, that's nice. It's maybe not too surprising. Uh, like these, uh, commonalities have been seen before these connections between the surface code and the, the topological cluster state model. Um, it was actually identified in the, the first paper, uh, by Rausendorf, uh, Bravi and Harrington, RBH. And it was also even done in a more recent paper, um, by Andrew Bolt. Uh, Guillaume Dupont, Cianci, and uh, Stace and Barrett, uh, Stace and uh, David Poulan. Uh, and, and they kind of broke up, uh, they, they made a foliated model by kind of stacking up a bunch of codes and, and, uh, and entangling them with like transversal control set gates. And they all found that you get this surface code this way. So there are lots of ways of breaking. This is, I wanna talk about this at the end. Uh, there are lots of ways you can break down the Rassendorf model into like the stabilizer picture in a way. And that's gonna be helpful. Right, so here's what we did in our paper. We, we, we made this model of code deformations. Uh, at, well, yeah, we can do any code deformation we want with any stabilizer code we want, but the goal our, the goal we set out to do at the beginning was to map uh, code deformations with the surface code into the measurement based picture. So yeah, that's what we did. So in particular, what, what's nice is the, this, so yeah. And so Hector Bombin, uh, he, he proposed uh, twists in the surface code. And in my paper here, I showed how those twists are really just living in the boundaries in between rough and smooth boundaries. And um, well, these twists, they're kind of like mere anamodes, and you can understand a lot about quantum computation with the surface code by seeing these mere um, Another thing you can understand is lattice surgery, and Daniel Latinsky more recently has really exploited all of these facts in, in his work. Um, so yeah, what, what happens, so on the surface code, you can think of the places where a rough boundary meets a smooth boundary. You can think of that as like a mere anamode. And when you foliate that, you, you kind of extend into the time direction in the measurement based picture. So those, those Mehranas that live on the corners they actually extend into world lines. And we can move these twists around uh, we, with code deformations. So a, a code, def I haven't even really said what a code deformation is. A code deformation, it's kind of like this. You, 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 have, you have a code that you have and there's a code also that you want. Um, and one way to get that code is just to measure the code you want and you project onto that code you want because when you measure stuff in quantum mechanics, you you project onto the measurement outcome. Um, so in general, that might might make a big mess. But if you're smart about your initial code and your final code, um, if if the initial code and the final code have enough stabilizers in common, you can actually uh, make that projection and protect logical information that's encoded in the stabilizer code. So that's all the code deformation is. So and that's that's what we we do. So for example, here's one example. This is a, a lattice surgery. Um, I, I mentioned the Horseman reference in the uh, one or two slides ago. And what, what, what's a lattice surgery? Well, if you have two surface codes and you want to do a parity measurement between them to do some kind of logical, I mean, this will give you some entangling operation. Well, if you, um, yeah, if, if you start with two surface codes and you measure them together in one big rectangular surface code, um, this does that parity measurement. And while we foliated that, here we have two surface codes, this time is running up. And what we found was you get a fusion measurement between the, the Mehranas of the two surface codes that go into this operation. 
And then when we break them apart again, these, the, yeah, we, we, we get this H shape. So this is, this is what a, uh, a lattice surgery looks like in this measurement based picture. And we can see these, these fusion measurements. So this is, um, and this is a model we would call, uh, uh, how do you call that? Uh, measurement only topological quantum computation that was introduced by Bondus and Friedman and I think Nyack, but station Q guys around 2007. So we also take, uh, we also show that we can braid Mayoranas using a code deformation um, that kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of based on um, this code by Yoder and Kim from 2017. Uh, they, they invent this thing called the twisted surface code. Well, we, we kind of, we, we come up with a code deformation where we start with the surface code and we glue on this rectangle on the side. It's, it's a bit like a lattice surgery in this, uh, yeah, but it's a code deformation uh, that gives you this twisted surface code with a twist in the middle. And we find there is a sequence of code deformations we can make where, um, where we perform a, a, an S gate on the encoded information. And if you look at the Mehranas in, in the, this sequence, you find that the two Mehranas get exchanged. So this is what actually why the general theory of foliation was necessary because to do this code deformation, you need some Pauli Y measurements. Uh, this, this code is actually a non-CSS code, so that's why we had to generalize beyond the work of um, Andrew Bolt et al. And so one other final thing to mention is that initialization also fits. You, you can think of initialization as a code deformation, so we can use our model to show how to initialize qubits. Um, if we initialize all in, in the surface code model, if we initialize all of our qubits in zero, and then we start measuring the surface code stabilizers, we fault tolerantly initialize a logical zero. And in the Mayorana picture, everything is consistent. Like this is how we would fault tolerantly prepare, um, yeah, qubits with Mayorana modes. Um, and, and we can also make noisy initializations of, um, of, uh, uh, was a magic state. So if you want to do magic states, uh, we can initialize them this way and using all the Clifford gates that we've also shown using our theory, uh, we can, we can do universal quantum computation. And so those are our results. Um, we, yeah, we, we build this model of foliation and we show how to do logical operations, all the logical operations with the surface code. And, and in fact, any code deformation with any stabilizer code, we can map it into some cluster state picture and that's useful for photonic quantum computation. Right, so I still have about three minutes, which I think is just right. Um, Cause what I wanna say at the end, I, I told you at the beginning that this isn't just for people who uh, wanna build photonic quantum computers. Uh, this is actually interesting for everybody um, because measurement based quantum computation really shows us how fault tolerant quantum computations work. Like, we don't just care about memories, we care about doing computations. Like that's what a quantum computer is gonna do. And uh, so that has to do a bunch of stuff of, and processing and evolution over time. And measurement-based quantum computation really puts us, really shows us the process behind this. So, um, and it, it will also show us how to um, come up with new models and how, yeah, how noisy measurements or noisy all sorts of stuff are going to change us. So let, let, what I want to do is I want to show all the different ways we have. I want to take this measurement-based model and pull it apart in all the ways we can, right? And this, and I want to talk a little bit about how this has helped people uh, or how people have used this to come up with new results. And I, you know, I kind of want to give people, uh, you know, some ideas on what you can do with this model still. Um, right, so originally, uh, this whole model was some big manifold. This is how I described it at the beginning some big manifold and you break it up into little zero dimensional cells. And this was the way Rausendorf introduced it. And this is kind of nice because, um, well, more recently in, uh, say this Nickerson and Bombin paper and this Mike Newman and Ken Brown paper, they, they actually changed the cells, the shape of these cells. And they came up with, uh, they came up with lattices with better thresholds. So it's kind of nice seeing this decomposition of this big three dimensional model because uh, you can change it and you can play with it and you can find better thresholds and better loss tolerance and all kinds of stuff uh, that you might want. Okay, but it's been broken down in other ways as well. So um, in 2016, uh, Andrew Ball et al, I mentioned this one, they took that Rausendorf model and they said, well, there's a bunch of surface codes all stacked up. Um, 
and they use this. This is a nice simple picture. And um, well, they use this picture to build new kinds of decoders. Um, they, uh, or fault tolerant decoders. So they, they use the fact that uh, the measurement based model is really just like noisy measurement stabilizer quantum computation. They came up with some new decoders this way. Um, yeah, so you can break this model down, this Rausendorf model down in other ways. So what Hector showed us uh, a couple of years ago now is that if you divide your model into the, the primal and dual qubits and you measure out the, the dual ones, then you get a, some 3D stabilizer code in some random gauge. And well, if you just fix that gauge, you, you now have the whole 3D code and that allows you to do some non clifford gates. So that's, that's really, so Hector showed us this in, in this paper down here on the archive and that's, a, he showed us that with the color code, but really those tricks are all I used in uh, this other paper uh, that was published earlier this year. And so there we just, we don't even break it into pieces at all. We just see it as this big 3D model. And so finally, where does our work sit in all of this? Well, we broke, we took this 3D model and we'd said, well, these, uh, this model is a bunch of qubits that live on these 1D, one-dimensional cluster states. And then just by coupling them all together with some ancillas, uh, this gives us the 3D model again. And so what advantages did we get here? Well, uh, we got, uh, well, we, we can take any code we want. It's not just surface codes anymore. We can, we can input any advance we've made in the, the stabilizer formalism with code deformations over the last, you know, 20 years or however long we've been thinking about it and pull it into this measurement based picture. And so all of these pictures are now connected via this, um, yeah, via this Rausendorf topological cluster state model. And I, I think it's, this is a nice way to view fault tolerant quantum computation in general. And maybe we should think about pulling these. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we, we should be looking at fault tolerant quantum computation, pulling it apart and sticking it together in other ways to get better thresholds or better gates. And all of these little decompositions show you different ways you might be able to do that. And I think that's, yeah, this is a big picture that I quite like to think about lately. So I, I'm going to stop there uh, on this picture. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Ben, for a great talk. Um, if anyone has a question, just pop it in the Q&A window or the uh, webinar chat window. And then Ben will also log into Slack later on, but I don't see any questions there yet. Uh, in the right. meantime, I'll just ask a question. So you mentioned the Nickerson, Bombin, and Newman papers. Mm -hmm. They have something which they describe as um, a cluster state that you can do measurement-based, fault-tolerant measurement-based quantum computing on that isn't foliated. Mm -hmm. But is there any way to think about it in the language that you've described? So foliated means that there's a bunch of things which are one qubit world lines in some sense, and you have well-defined slices that you can cut through and define codes on, but is it possible yeah. to still find world lines, but just the slices aren't there? Um, well, I kind of, I, I mean, what, what does non-foliated even mean? It, like, it's not difficult to prepare, um, like you don't have to build cluster states with chip, uh, with uh, photonics. You could actually just build a chip that periodically reproduces surface code, uh, cluster state over and over and over again, right? In fact, like, if, as soon as you even consider something like a leakage reduction scheme um, or a leakage protection scheme, this is already a non-foliated model too. And you do that in the circuit model. What, what do you do? You have your qubit that you think of as this static thing running through some world line. And you just teleport your information onto some other nearby qubit that, that you've just prepared freshly. And this is your leakage reduction scheme. That's not, uh, you know, that, that doesn't really fit into the framework of foliation either. Or it kind of does. It depends how you want to look at it. Um, it yeah, I, I mean, the, the, I guess the, the point is you're you're trying to um, you're trying to reproduce this cluster state. Um, I, 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 yeah, I know I, I understand why they called this uh, beyond foliation, but these beyond foliated things you can reproduce with static qubits on chip as well. So I, I don't know if it, it, I don't think it's some magic power that uh, photonic qubits have. I guess the point was that there are well-defined slices and for each slice you can describe it using a code that has some parameters n, k, d that stay constant throughout all of the slices. Yeah, well, yeah, I, you could probably do that. I, I mean, I, I think you would maybe want to jump between these pictures a little bit though. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, they all have disadvantages that the other ones pick up on as well. Like, so this, the, this foliated picture, it has a very regular periodic structure in time. And if you go over to this, um, this cellular decomposition, you're not, you don't have that constraint anymore. So that's really useful for improving thresholds and things. Um, I, yeah, how, yeah, no, you're a question. I understand your, I, yeah, sorry, I, I'm not answering your question. Uh, I, I, let me just try one more time. It was um, a very, that is a very open-ended question. I'm not sure if there is a clean answer to it, but yeah. Andrew's got a question, which is, we know 3D cluster states can be implemented in a bilayer architecture with photonic quantum computation. At the last session, Thomas Joachim O'Connor told us about some interesting properties of the 4D and 5D surface codes. Can 4D and 5D cluster states be realized in a bilayer architecture also? Um, I, I, in a bilayer. I guess maybe it's, um, in 2D, but with two, two 2D slices, right? Where you alternate between the slices. You might consider making a 4D architecture with, with some three dimensional system. Uh, I, I mean, really, yeah. You, sorry, Ian. I've got to turn, it's getting dark here. I've got to turn the light on. No, it's, um, it's a uh, good question. Uh, um, I, I mean, you can make four dimensions out of three plus one and use time dimension to make a four dimension, uh, a four dimensional cluster state. Like, why not? Uh, as long as, um, as long as, yeah, as long as all the information propagates in the right way. So, well, I mean, what we saw, what Hector showed us as well in, in this paper is, all that's well and good. You can produce this 3D model in with a two-dimensional array of live qubits, but you, you need to consider quite a lot of stuff to make sure that all the feed forward is dealt with correctly and you need a just-in-time decoder to deal with it. Now, I, I would guess that you can produce a whole 4D toric code if, if you want to get some advantages out of that. If you pick the one of the self-correcting ones, I, I could see how you might be able to use a just-in-time decoder and produce that with some 3D array of qubits. I, I, I don't know how you would use a 2D array. Well, a 2D array and some non-local couplings maybe. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any like silver bullets or anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not obvious how you peel off more than one dimension, right? Yeah, that's right. That, I think that's the, that's the challenge. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, there's only one time direction, right? If, if time was, it was more than one dimension, more than one axis. Maybe we could do a bit more stuff, but as far as I know, it's not. Okay. Non local link to help as well. I guess we'll all thank Ben over on the uh, Slack channel. And if you can log in there later, Ben, if anyone has any follow up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that again. All right. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you all again soon, I hope. <laughs>